All right, joining me now is Michael Beckley from Tufts University, and he has uh, researched the great power competition between China and the United States. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Is China, do you think, on the cusp of wading into this conflict between Ukraine and Russia and actually supplying weapons to Russia? I, I think it's likely. I think China has already been inching down that road for some time. There's been reports that have come out recently showing that China has already been sending Russia critical components, including uh, parts for, for jet fighters and computer chips and navigation systems. And so it's not such a big stretch to think that China would up that and transition fully into lethal forms of aid. And I just think if you an analysis of China's interests suggests that China simply can't let Russia go down to a devastating defeat in this war. And as the war continues to drag on and Putin is getting more desperate to mobilize more soldiers and maybe running out of supplies in the long term, it just seems straightforward that China would have to start getting involved. Why? I mean, wh wh why can't they let them go down to defeat in Ukraine? Well, I, I think what happens in Ukraine will probably not stay in Ukraine because you're basically throwing a big chunk of Russia's military power into a meat grinder. And so Russia will be essentially a neutered great power after that. That obviously has implications for political stability within Russia. Can Putin really afford to lose uh, a war that he had advertised as a special military operation? Um, and so, you know, it runs the risk of a destabilized or at least insecure country right on China's borders. But I think more broadly, I mean, China just doesn't have that many allies in the world. It certainly doesn't have many powerful allies in the world. Sure, it has North Korea, it has Pakistan, which is a total economic basket case at this point. But in terms of really powerful allies, Russia is pretty much it. And so losing that at a time when the West is uniting against these authoritarian powers, I think poses long-term risks. And China has to worry that if Russia is essentially eliminated from the great power sweepstakes, that suddenly the West's attention is going to be directed at China itself. Yeah, you know, over the weekend, CIA Director William Burns um, was interviewed and he said that President Xi has watched the unfolding conflict in Ukraine carefully and would be disappointed by Russia's performance one year on now, uh, you know, we're just a little bit past one year on from February the 24th. Um, do you think that she is disappointed to the to the point that he feels he's got to get involved and prop up President Putin? I, it, it would appear so from all indications. I mean, just the fact that we ha there is intelligence suggesting China is going to start sending lethal aid to Russia shows that after much hand-wringing, China feels that we've reached a point where without that kind of support, Russia could go down to that devastating defeat that we just talked about. And, you know, I think ideally China would love to have it both ways where it can sort of maintain plausible deniability while keeping Russia going. Even frankly, uh, an extended uh, uh, war that bogs down the West might not be such a bad outcome for China, but it's just looking that if this war turns into a stalemate on the ground in Ukraine and then Russia's military power is increasingly ground down, that China at some point is going to have to get involved, especially since the West looks like it's going to be continuing to increase the amount of military hardware that's going to be flowing into Ukraine. There's going to be discussions about F-16 fighter jets coming up um, by all accounts. And so, um, you know, it seems like it's only getting better and better military equipment. And so at some point, uh, China may feel it has to help equalize things by supporting Russia. So is President Biden making a mistake when he, you know, stands on the podium in Poland, for instance, and frames the conflict as an exis existential struggle between democracy and autocratic regimes. I mean, maybe by doing that, doesn't he up the ante for China? Well, I, I think the ante was upped when, you know, Russia came pouring into Ukraine, because I, I just I think if you've been reading what Putin has been writing and, and saying that Ukraine was not going to be sort of the end goal of Russian expansion, it was going to be a starting point for Russian expansion. And so the fact that Putin has been stopped there doesn't necessarily mean that the conflict is some local limited war that somehow doesn't impinge on the interests of the United States and its democratic allies. So I think that framing totally makes sense. I take your point that it may heighten, it symbolically may heighten the stakes for China, but frankly, China is a cold calculating great power. And so I think they thought long before this conflict had emerged that Russia and China share a 
profound and common interest in pushing back at the existing international order and at the United States and its allies. And so the fact that that Cold War has now gone hot doesn't fundamentally change Chinese interests. It just changes, changes the circumstances in which China has to act. Chinese interests, I mean, include economic trade, right? And if you take a look at Russia, I mean, it's one of China's smallest trading partners. So risk versus reward in terms of supporting Russia, clearly the Americans and the European Union are wagging a finger at China right now, warning them that if they step into this in a big way, it is going to cost them. And so their biggest trading partners are America and the, the European Union is huge. So, I mean, is China willing to put that on the line? I think, first of all, we have to recognize that Xi Jinping has shown time again he's willing to sacrifice China's economic growth if it enhances either his power or China's power on the international stage. I mean, the zero COVID lockdowns are the most obvious manifestation of that. There's many other examples. So we shouldn't look at Xi Jinping like he's some hedge fund manager that's trying to maximize China's trade volumes or GDP growth. He think he's a nationalist that thinks in terms of broader geopolitical objectives. And I agree with you that, of course, China ideally would love to have it both ways. It would love to maintain these trade links as long as it needs the Europeans and the Americans for their technology and their markets. But he also has launched a long-term strategy of self-reliance. This is what the Chinese called their dual circulation policy, where they want to start creating a system where Chinese companies are selling primarily to the Chinese markets, sourcing their components from within China. And then to the extent that they can't get things domestically, they want to, through Belt and, the Belt and Road Initiative, basically carve out this economic empire with new markets, new sources of resources, so they don't have to be so reliant on the Americans or even the Europeans or the Japanese, because they just view those countries as inevitably hostile towards China. So I think, you know, China has been going down this road, this attempt to become more self-reliant. And so I think at a certain point, Xi Jinping is, is calculating that, okay, we may we may face more trade barriers, but that's probably inevitable anyway. And our long-term strategy is to decouple key industries from uh, these, these hostile powers and carve out our own economic fiefdom. And so if we have to take more short-term economic costs, that's worth it if we have to accomplish this longer-term geopolitical goal. What do you think is the fallout in terms of Taiwan? Do you think that you know the the West likes to look at this, you know, from the from the point of view that well, this will probably dissuade China because they'll see that the solidarity of NATO and the solidarity of the West in terms of what they've done in Ukraine, they'll do the same with Taiwan. And when they take a look at the fighting ability uh, of of the equipment that the West has, that you know maybe they'll be dissuaded by that. Do you, uh, some people would say that that's maybe not very believable and that if China is serious about Taiwan, Ukraine may or may not play a very big factor in that. Yeah, I, I think it's really tough to know for sure, just because at the end of the day, the decision is made by Xi Jinping and we were not inside of his head. Clearly, there's there's a lot of evidence suggesting conquest is really difficult and that the West is more united than maybe we had thought more, you know, a year or so ago. Um, and so hopefully that would uh, deter Xi Jinping from um, and give him some humility about his place in history, that he doesn't necessarily have to reunite the mainland in Taiwan on his watch, as he sort of suggested in some of his statements. But on the other hand, you know, you could have said similar things about Putin, you know, prior to this war, uh, that, you know, this would be a very tough war for, for Russia, that uh, the West would unite against him. And he clearly decided to gamble and underestimated the costs. And I think we have to realize that dictators don't always get the best information. I mean, anyone that is surrounded by sycophants, whether it's pop stars or sports stars or dictators, can start to, I mean, I think just psychologically that would affect anyone. And Xi Jinping, you know, with his anti-corruption campaign has killed more messengers than pretty much uh, any any modern, uh, any current leader, I think. And so um, I, I just worry that he may not be getting the best information or may make similar miscalculations um, to Putin. He also, I think the Chinese also view themselves as much as superior to Russia, at least militarily, that they would never be as careless as the Russians, that their military is in much better shape. Their military budget, I think, is about four times the size of, of Russia's, and they've been gearing up for this contingency for a long time. And so it's possible they may say, you know, the lesson is not to do conquest, it's actually to do it big and brutal 
from the start. Don't just kind of stumble in to our target um, uh, willy nilly. We should pulverize Taiwan's forces from the start with all these thousands of missiles we've acquired over the last 10 years and then have a mad dash towards Taipei and maybe even to take out the American military bases on Okinawa. And one thing they may have learned also is that rattling the nuclear saber can pay big dividends because Putin has clearly been able to instill some caution on behalf of the United States and its allies by referencing that. So, I mean, I, I just yeah, think from the- from Referencing the, it over and over again. Right, right. So from, I, I would say, you know, if I was just a, a neutral, you know, uh, observer and had no interest in this, I might say, okay, hopefully she will be cautious. But if you're a, a defense planner on the American or the allied side, you cannot assume that Xi Jinping will be deterred by Russia's uh, catastrophe. So why is China bothering with this 12 point, you know, ceasefire plan? They, some people call it a peace plan. Um, what, what, what are they trying to do? Are they really sincerely trying to get the fighting stopped there? And th there is a flurry now of people, you know, turning towards China, seeing it as a possible key to get Putin to take the temperature down. I mean, President Macron of, of France is, is going to China in early April. And then uh, even the Belarusian leader, uh, Lukashenko, who is Russia's ally, is going there and he may be a back door by the way you know as you may know he may be a back door for weapons to to russian uh, forces fighting in ukraine right i think this is a clear two step strategy you know on the one hand you want to cultivate this image if you're china of being an honest broker of wanting to bring the war to an end and i do think that china its its ideal scenario would be a war that ends with russia having made significant territorial gain. So basically locking in parts of the status quo. Um, and even if Russia has been weakened, that just makes it more dependent economically on China. So I do think China would like that. But I also think the Chinese are certainly smart enough to know that that's very unlikely to be accepted. So I think the other point of putting forward this this 12 point peace plan was just it's essentially a PR exercise. You know, it shows that China is trying to be this responsible citizen. Maybe we'll uh, alleviate some of the tensions, especially with the Europeans, where China is still hoping, as you pointed out earlier, to maintain uh, trade links. Um, but at the same time, China is doing all kinds of things, creating facts on the ground, you know, meeting with Belarus, potentially using that to smuggle in supplies to, to Russia. Um, and so it, it, I don't detect a serious, significant change in Chinese policy. And the fact that Xi Jinping says bland things like, you know, nuclear war would be bad, essentially, uh, you know, that, that this is not like a, a serious attempt to accommodate any Ukrainian interest. It's essentially a pro-Russia plan to ratify some of the territorial gains it's already made. Okay. So if I'm listening to this interview and listening to you, and, and I know you understand China very well, I would probably, if I was a betting person, put my money on the idea that China is going to increase arms to Russia and help Russia. The conflict then spirals, you know, out of control even further what, I mean, what is your fear? I mean, some people have talked about World War III starting here, but I mean, what what is your fear? If China indeed does this, what will be the response by America and and the collective West? Um, and and where does this go from here then? Yeah, I mean, I think it essentially takes this war and clearly makes it. I, I think what it already was, frankly, which is is it's, it's not just a war in in Eastern Europe. I mean, this was always sort of a proxy battle between broader geopolitical forces, namely the United States and its allies and this sort of Russia, China, so-called no limits partnership and their motley crew of allies, you know, like Belarus, as we've mentioned, I would add Iran into that into that crew. So it clearly just accentuates the proxy war elements. And so I think the, the immediate impacts are first, you'll have more US-China decoupling because the United States will, of course, sanction any Chinese entities that are directly involved in, in supplying um, Russia, but I think just more broadly, it's going to it's going to completely it's going to lead to more decoupling between Europe and China as well, because the Europeans already feel like the the well is being the well of goodwill is being quickly poisoned by the fact that China hasn't come out against Russia, and so if it then becomes clear that China is actively supplying Russia with lethal aid, I think you'll see a major sea change in European opinion, which is already shifting against China. So it really just hardens these geopolitical boundaries. I don't think it's, it necessarily starts, you know, a war, an actual shooting war between China uh, 
and the United States and its allies, but it just it dials up the tension dramatically in what is quickly becoming, I think, a, a Cold War situation. I mean, it's certainly a Cold War situation with Russia. And uh, and then, you know, what do you have, like some kind of iron curtain falling between America and China? I mean, this, the economic stakes are monstrous, right? And, and uh, there was already a lot of criticism of the Biden administration within the United States, where they say this should have happened a long time ago, decoupling, so-called decoupling from China. And let's just get on with it, because the longer the trade continues at the levels that it is, it, it's just funding the Chinese war machine. Yeah, I, th I think that's that's likely. I mean, that, that was a trend that was going at anyways, but I think the pace will accelerate it'll be expanded uh very quickly i i do want to point out i don't i don't foresee a total collapse of trade between say the united states and europe on one hand and china on the other but in strategic so-called strategic industries anything remotely strategic that where it's leading edge technologies you know computer chips anything with the biosciences energy efficiency renewable energy all these kind of really critical technologies that people think are going to be the key industries of the 21st century and especially those related to either China's internal security apparatus or obviously its military, I think you would see accelerated decoupling happening very quickly if it turns out China is uh, supplying lethal aid to Russia. Last question to you, and I really do appreciate the time that you've given us. And, and that would be, you're in the United States. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm here in London. How do you, certainly, I mean, I, I think that the tone in Europe is support Ukraine long-term. Um, it's just a question of this war expanding further into Europe, whether it be the former Soviet republics or even, you know, even further. There are already threats towards Poland and the, the Baltics, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. It goes on and on. But in the U.S., I mean, you see some politicians on the right talking about what are we what road are we going down? Let, let's why are we supporting Ukraine at the level that we are? Billions of dollars. Um, at, what is what is the long term strategy for the U.S. if this is just going to become a a further deepening crisis that draws the U.S. more and more into the conflict? Do you read um, that 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 split in some of the debate in America is substantial, and that uh, you know as you have American elections looming uh, in in uh, 2024, then do you see that the U.S. could pivot away from Ukraine and the support, or or do you just see it as noise, kind of on the on the far right? I think maybe somewhere in the middle of those two. So I don't think it's noise. I mean, you have leading high profile politicians uh, making the exact points that you just referenced, and obviously um, Donald Trump, who is the presumptive you know Republican nominee or certainly one of the leading contenders. This is very consistent with. The foreign policy mantra that he put forward that you know american interests should be put front and center the chief geopolitical adversary is china but on the other hand i i you know i actually i i'm relatively um i i feel pretty confident that you still will have sustained american support for one reason just given that china seems to be getting more involved itself and so you're linking you know if you're serious about getting tough with china then suddenly it's it's pretty clear that this war in ukraine is is somewhat linked to America's policy towards China as well. So to some extent, China is doing some of that heavy lifting um, uh, for uh, American advocates of, of continued intervention. I also just think the way that the war plays out, there's just going to be more Russian atrocities, for example, that are going to come to light, you know, that can that reignite that flame of saying we have to support uh, the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians have been fighting valiantly, and now they're getting their hands on even more sophisticated weapons. And so they could make some major gains that also furthers American support. So I think it's always going to be there. It's significant. Um, it's it. You can't count it out, uh, especially if it looks like the Ukrainians start to lose. And it's like, well, then what are we doing supporting a losing effort? Um, but I think for the time being, it looks like uh, the bulk of public opinion, the bulk of the leadership in, in both Congress and obviously in the White House is going to continue to support supplying the Ukrainians. All right. Michael Beckley from Tufts University. Michael, great to talk to you. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on.